Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier 1 People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search. Welcome to Fintech Chatter, the show that connects leaders from the Fintech community to share their learnings on leadership, hiring, entrepreneurship, raising capital, scaling, and of course, a bit of chat. I'm your host, Dexter Cousins. And this year, Tier 1 People is committed to showcasing 50 of Australia's up and coming fintechs. Show your support for the next wave of Aussie founders with a like, a subscribe, so we can spread the word on this great group of people. If you prefer to listen, follow the Fintech Chatter podcast, and please remember to leave a five star review if you love the show. It really helps other fintech fans like you discover the channel. And if you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Now, on to today's guest. She's one of the most promising leaders in fintech and CEO of blockchain startup Giora. Giora is a technology platform for farmers, helping them manage supply chain and finance through smart contracts. It tackles one of the biggest challenges facing humanity, the efficient distribution of farm produce. Recently backed by NAB Ventures and Tenacious Ventures, Giora is poised for the next phase of growth. Brady, welcome to Fintech Chatter TV. Great to have you with us. I'm really, really excited to be here, Dexter. Nice to chat with you. It's been a while. It's been, it has been a while. I think the last time we spoke, you were up for another award. <laughs> um, and yeah, we was, uh, I think we were, we were in the midst of another COVID lockdown. So um, it's nice to be speaking to you, not in lockdown. Yeah, that's true. I can uh, go for a walk after this. <laughs> Bridie, I, w- I wanted to invite you on the show because what I believe that you're doing and, and the team at Jura are doing is something that clearly impacts on every Australian's lives. But would you like to share with our followers a little bit about Giora and what you do? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I guess we're one of those uh, startup slashies that does cross over quite a few different domains. Um, we're an ag tech slash fintech slash deep tech kind of blockchain startup. And that doesn't really mean anything until you know what we do. But we basically are working with farmers to help connect them in with economies and data economies um, because everything that we're focused on at Giora is about how we support agriculture and making it more sustainable, more efficient and more secure. Um, it doesn't sound like we're a fintech company when I tell you that we're you know, working to make agriculture more sustainable, but when it comes down to it, like a lot of that is about finance, access to capital, being able to invest in regenerative practices and I think a lot of the time as a conscious consumer, we are quite separate from that problem of, okay, yes, we know we need to change how we produce food if we're going to meet our um, sustainability targets. How do we actually do that? I mean, for a lot of the 570 million farmers around the world, that is completely dependent on being able to invest on farm, invest in better sustainable practices, invest in doing things differently. So, um, what we're seeing is there's actually an opportunity for all of us to more actively invest in our future as a, as a globe, uh, sorry, as a global economy, um, because we are able to invest in ag. So um, that's what we're focused on at GR is how do we invest in the future of agriculture and how do we make that something that we're all sharing uh, in, the, in the problem space and in the opportunities. And so can you tell us a little bit more about the platform and how it works? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Jura is kind of like um, a website builder. If you've used like Webflow or Squarespace, um, they make it really easy to set up your own website. Uh, we're kind of like that, but for digitizing and connecting a supply chain. So, I mean, at the moment, supply chains are basically uh, operated off pen, paper, maybe Excel, um, phone calls and emails. And what we're doing is we're connecting them in to a digital platform. Um, so that a farmer can upload a whole lot of data at one end and an investor or a consumer of a product can receive that information at the other. So we're able to provide this like really premium digital supply chain to complement everything that's happening on a physical supply chain to solve problems around trust and information transmission between parties. Um, Major issues and, and challenges 
not only now, but but headwinds that are facing global supply chains, um, the uh, I guess global warming, what we're seeing in Ukraine, and the you know supply of wheat. Where do you see um, Giora being able to play a role in and actually facilitating and overcoming some of those those challenges and headwinds? Yeah, I mean, I think you can't kind of get through a single page on a news site at the moment without seeing the supply chain challenges we're facing at the moment. And it's been like that and really front of mind for so many people um, for the last couple of years in particular. Uh, I think if you look, um, there's kind of a couple of stories that you're seeing there, right? Like one is around like supply chain and supply chain parties and actually being able to um, interact with each other, being able to sell to each other for, I mean, a lot of grain growers in Australia, unfortunately, the, the lack of grain in the global market right now is an opportunity for them. But even when there is an opportunity and, you know, it, it flips all the time, right? You have a drought one year and you don't have the opportunity, then something happens the next and you do. Um, it's really like, how do we make sure that when, when a physical product is in abundance, when there, when there's, you know, high demand for your product as a farmer, that you're actually able to capitalize on that because at the moment, um, the way that many supply chains work is you really have one option. Whoever's at the end of the road, uh, they're the person you can sell to. Uh, you, you know them, you have a trust relationship with them. As a grower, you might not know about you know global pricing and what your opportunities are elsewhere. If I decide to sell to a buyer, you know, if I'm in young in, in Australia and I decide to sell to a buyer in Singapore and I don't know them, how do I know I'm going to get paid? Uh, it's you know it's, it's highly risky behavior often. So. What we're doing at uh, Giora is definitely trying to provide more security for that farmer when they're trying to make decisions and trying to make a better marketing decision for their product in a global market, both by giving them information, but also providing that payment security through the platform. They are actually going to get paid for their produce. Uh, so that's one side of it. And the other side of it is supporting kind of the entire supply chain. So some of those issues you touched on, like they're huge. And we know if we want to address our sustainable development goals, for example, it's an extra $2.1 trillion each year that we need to be investing in our ag supply chain. Wow. That's currently money that, you know, this is not just like more efficient money or cheaper money or better delivered money. This is new money that we need. And so we need to find that capital somewhere and inject it into the farmers uh, on the land because they need to be making those changes to solve challenges around food security, use of land, and water and energy resourcing and um, all those kind of like big uh, ticket items that are going to move the needle on our sustainability goals, it's going to require a lot of investment. And so part of Giora's role is being able to connect those farmers with new sources of finance. Um, there are a lot of people who really care about ag and want to invest in ag. Um, but at the moment, like, you know, if you or I wanted to invest in a pig farmer in Papua New Guinea, how are we going to do that? Uh, so we're working to to make that um, to make that pathway available. So to almost like crowdfunding for agriculture, right? And I think um, I think that there's something to that, right? Like being able to actually have like peer to peer engagement. Sometimes, as a you know a farmer, you might have a whole lot of capital you're sitting on, and you're wanting to invest in someone else down the road. Um, so there's there's different ways here that. Um, we need to be thinking differently and, and in a more clever way around financing the supply chain. Like obviously the, the banks at one end of town are carrying an enormous part of supply chain finance. It's huge parts of their business um, and they are continuing to improve how they do that. Um, but there is, there is scope and there are kind of products that um, are available in a different kind of lending marketplace and we're really interested in those opportunities. Mm -hmm. You had some good news recently um, with with an investment round. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that means for the business and, and kind of what your plans are um, from here on in and, and around growth and hiring, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. I think you would have um, been able to like see my early stage, like founder tears of happiness, I think, in that email where I was like, Dexter, we finished <laughs> our seed round. <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah, we're really, we're really excited that uh, we finalized our seed fundraising round at the end of last year. Um, for us, we, you know, we had one lead investor in mind that we really, really wanted to lead the round. We knew that they get ag, they get our opportunity um, and they understand that 
uh, what it's going to take. Uh, we wanted them on our journey. And so we're stoked that Tenacious Ventures are our lead investor in that round. Um, we also have follow on investment from NAB Ventures. So this is like our typical slashy bucket, right? Mm. We've got, um, you know, amazing participation in our seed round from Australia's largest agri lender. Uh, so it's really cool to have NAB in there um, and be working with them. Um, and we, you know, we've also got the backing of, uh, of Flying Fox in that round and, um, they, you know, they've just been so good to us already. So we're just like, we're so happy. We couldn't be happy with our, our pool of investors. Um, and, uh, for us, I guess it's kind of a seed fundraising round in lots of ways feels like, um, a, you know, a, a significant maturing stage for, yeah. for a company like ours, um, we obviously we have a product and we do have customers already, but I think it kind of changes the game when you've got the support of those names who really understand the market and they're able to lend, um, you know, their expertise to what we're doing as well. I think that's yeah. like super helpful. And, you know, for anyone else fundraising, I would really, really encourage, um, you know, all founders really early on to think to what, what am I getting out of this money? And everyone says, you know, not all money's equal, but, you know, being on the other side and actually having had that finalized, uh, it really isn't. And, and it's really invaluable when you can say, yeah, you know, you've got someone like an, who's an expert in your field on call to support with any challenge that you might be facing. It's super, super helpful mm. stuff. I just had a chat, um, earlier this morning, actually, with a, another startup that's just raised, I think around six to eight million in, in seed money. And the first thing that they wanted to do was to engage me to, <laughs> and spend some of that on my fees, which I said, hey, no, <laughs> that's not, not the best use of the, the capital. Um, how, how do you feel when you, you're given that check, Bridie? And, and what is it that you kind of, you know, is, is your kind of belief that, when you raise capital, particularly seed capital, it's what's the purpose of that capital for and, and where do you see yourself investing that money? Yeah, I think that I think with a seed round, it's interesting because lots of investors will tell you that they're investing in founders at that stage and they're investing in who you are and what you believe in. And I think that, you know, that's obviously very flattering and to see that come through and see people have faith in you and in who you are and what you're bringing to the table. Um, is fantastic. Uh, I think though what it's meant for me and what it's meant for our team is, okay, this is now about our product, our platform and our customers. It's great that our seed investors believe in you know, my, my co-founder and I, and they believe that we have what it takes to provide a solution into this problem space. Um, now it's all about what does that solution look like? So we need to be able to scale ourselves um, to scale offering to market and to really prove that we can build something that is bigger than, than our, than just Cadel and I. Um, so I think that for me, that's, that's what coming out of the finalizing of the seed round meant was like, okay, great. So how do I bring in a team who's awesome? How do I, um, take a message to market where, uh, it's not just me having a, you know, an hours long conversation with each of our potential pilot customers and personally getting them on board, but we're actually able to like scale our offering to a much larger group of customers, like being able to prove that, um, I can scale what I believe into something which is a product and is bigger than me feels like a really big challenge, um, coming out of seed funding. Um, and it's really exciting, uh, but obviously very daunting to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, try and then build a team at a very early stage and like hand over that startup baby a little bit um, with the hopes that, you know, you're going to like 10x, 100x what you could do on your own. Mm. Um, you talked about investors investing actually in the founders themselves. Um, you and I were first introduced, I think, when I, I did one of the, the Finney's Awards um, podcast shows and you were up for Emerging Leader of the Year and I was blown away by... Um, not just how you presented yourself, Brady, but the, the backstory to how you started Giora as well. Um, and I wondered if you might be able to kind of share with the, the followers that we've got a little bit about your story and kind of how you got to where you are now, um, in the hope that, hey, they might see something there that, that kind of resonates, that they can identify that investors might see a similar thing in them. Yeah, uh, that's that feels like so long ago. <laughs> I'm just thinking back to then. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, I think that I've always kind of, um, felt that I have accidentally founded a company. Um, I was never kind of out on a mission to set up, um, a, a startup or set up a small business. And I, I know that people kind of have different ways that they land in an opportunity and with an opportunity in front of them. But for me, it was, it was very driven by the problem space. Um, and so I've always felt like I, um, was very concrete in what I care about and in what I, what I believe an opportunity where an opportunity lies. Um, and the kind of soft skills around being a founder and, and how to actually set up a business have kind of like literally grown in real time, sometimes slightly earlier, sometimes slightly later than they needed to, um, as this, you know, has taken on a life of its own. And so, um, I mean, in terms of how I got here, uh, I, I graduated law school desperate to not be a lawyer, um, and to, do, to do anything else really. I think that's and, about 70% of people that go to law school. I know. And we, we actually all seem to find each other and people kind of like, you know, subtly admit in the corner, right. That oh yeah, I'm, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, um, I ended up in front of Emma Weston who, is an amazing Aussie founder. Um, she was really early in setting up Agri Digital, and which is you know another ag tech business for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, and she needed someone to, you know, build IKEA furniture, write contracts, speak with customers. And I said I can do all of those things. Um, and so I joined uh, Agri Digital. I think as employee number two or three or something. And um, was really fortunate to be in a position where we were leading the charge of blockchain and ag and happened to end up running that, that project work stream. And this is, you know, as I say, I kind of fell into it. it. It really does feel like that still when I think back to what happened, you know, I was running this project work stream, Emma and I were getting like huge amount of interest in what we were proving, what we were testing with big players in, you know, Aussie ag and finance space. And, um, came to the point where we both felt like it made sense for that work stream to become Jura and to become its own business. Um, and so I, I think it was a bit of like right place, right time um, and just saying yes and feeling completely underqualified, but having the backing of someone who believed in me with Emma and just saying, OK, yeah, I'm just going to try this and um, trusting that the soft skills would would kind of develop, uh, you know, those kind of like the leadership side of things, you know, I, I'd never run a business before. I'd never, I'd never kind of registered a business, like a company before. <laughs> there were all these things that I just like both technically and in terms of like my own personal development that I was just trusting would, would come along with us as, as we grew. And, you know, that's still something right now when I'm hiring people at the moment, I'm like, I want someone who believes that they are going to develop as the company grows and who's going to grow with the company. And, um, I was saying this to my co-founder Kato the other day, like if I stop, um, improving, uh, on my own performance in my own job, like I'm going to be underqualified for my job really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's like, you know, that's been a big part of it is just trusting that um, these experiences are what's going to actually be the CV that keeps me qualified for my role um, and just running with the opportunity that was in front of me. Mm. Um, you taught there uh, uh, about some of your motivations and very, very different, almost in stark contrast to the stuff that you'll read on social media you know, typically the stuff that comes out of, you know, the kind of VC driven startup narratives where it's very alpha male and you, you know, you've got to be on it and you've got to hustle and you've got to be up at 5 a.m. and you've got to meditate and all this other stuff. Um, it, by the sounds of it, you know, you, you've come from a very different space, which is one of more of kind of authenticity and a one where, you know, the, the kind of mantra of being, you know, you, you don't choose leadership, leadership chooses you. Um, what, how do you think that that, yeah. You well, know, how do you feel about that kind of other side of it? I'm assuming, you know, I've, I've not got much experience in, in agriculture, but I wouldn't expect farmers to be, um, you know, kind of over gentle or, you know, kind of holding back in, in what they would say. How, how have you found kind of, you know, kind of operating in, in those environments, which are typically, you know, stereotypical, stereotypically alpha male driven and you being a you know fairly inexperienced female who let's face it you know guys are jerks most of us 
and I don't own, you know, own, that, not even, if we, even if we've got good intent, it <laughs> kind of doesn't come out of our mouths that way. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's so much in so many of those questions. Like there's my experience in, you know, 2018 within the crypto bro world of yeah. New York. Like, we haven't even talked about that, right? No, I know. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I work in, tech and agriculture, these are massively like male dominated industries. Um, so in terms of, you know, working with men, I, I always have worked with men, but I've always, I've always had female bosses, investors like that, you know, there are tons of awesome women in this space. Um, but I think, I think maybe like even beyond gender, one of the things that you're talking about, like for me is, is really about like motivation and drive. And, um, uh, I, I don't think that, um, you know, being purpose driven relieves you from the need to hustle. <laughs> I think that that's a, that is something that you absolutely need if you're going to, to, um, run a, a business through this kind I do of try to make a marathon. Yeah. Um, I do try to make a distinction on, there's a really fine line between hustle and hustle. And yeah. I think a lot of people confuse the two, you know, a lot are out there hustling others, believing that they're hustling and they're actually not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that for me, what, what motivates me, what drives me is I, I really, I couldn't think of anything that I would rather do with my time and my energy, uh, mm -hmm. than, than sit in this problem space. I, f for me, I, I know that there are, there's so many things about agriculture I will never be an expert in. Um, but I believe that I am and can continue to be this expert in bringing and connecting farmers in with financial and data economies. And so when I sit in a room full of farmers who collectively have, you know, hundreds of years of experience on the land, um, I'm not there to tell them how to do their job. You know, they know the land, they know their product better than anyone. Um, I'm there to share an opportunity and to share something that I really genuinely believe can help transform their businesses, their lives, their families and our, and our world. So I think that that really helps. Like I, I, I honestly think that believing in your product, believing in your vision, like has to be at the core of who you are um, because that shines through and, and I can sit there and, and tell um, a farmer about an opportunity and using their John Deere tractor data to connect in with real-time finance and change the pathway of where their crop's going to market. And I, I completely believe in that opportunity for them and the benefit for them. And I'm not going to tell them anything else about the cotton, <laughs> but, but I'll happily tell them about what their data and what their, the finance can mean. And um, yeah, I think that, I think being clear of, you know, where your expertise is and, and, making sure that you're continuing to learn where it's not your expertise, um, is really important. There's definitely an answer, <laughs> which is maybe a bit more cynical to your question, which is probably on like the bro culture side of things. And, um, it's a, yeah, that's a very, it's a very different situation because I think a lot of that comes down to imposter syndrome. Yeah. I remember, you know, at the time when I was founding Dura, I was 20, six or 27. Um, and I was sitting there one day being like, if I were to think of myself as a 26 year old guy who'd been working in blockchain for six years, five years, I would say there's no one else better to start a blockchain company. But as a 26 year old female, I thought I was like totally the wrong person. And I think I like caught myself in that moment to realize like, this is, you know, I'm undermining myself here. No one else is saying you can't do this. I'm saying, Oh, you know, maybe you're not qualified because I'm not a dude. Like, I think that there are definitely moments like that where you kind of have to check yourself and say, Hey, am I going to be a statistic right now? Yeah. Um, and lean on the people who you know are there to back you, um, and you know, back yourself because I, like there's totally been moments like that where the bro culture gets the better of you and you get asked if you're a you know, in marketing one too many times and go, wait, am I or actually HR. in product yeah. and tech? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Now, um, you talked there about the bro culture. It seems like all the talk in the last 12 months in blockchain and crypto 
is how much you can sell a JPEG of a monkey for and how much it's worth. <laughs> oh can my I gosh. Ask, how frustrating is it for somebody who's going out and addressing a real, you know, a problem that's impacting us all? Um, you know, the 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 statistics and the data shows that you know we're going to be in you know, world hunger in the next thirty to fifty years, and all the talk is going on a board ape, and here's you and your team building something that's actually going to have an imp- real impact on the world and there's nowhere near anywhere as much noise yeah um that's yeah i mean yes of course when you're kind of doing the invest rounds and hustling up seed capital and you see people just selling nfts for stupid amounts of money you go like am I doing this wrong? <laughs> check, check your own strategy. Like, is this really the best way to raise money? But um, no, I mean, there's definitely that side of it, but like hype cycles will always exist. And mm. I, I do think that the technology benefits from many of these activities. Um, I think that when we talk about like NFTs and tokens, and it's something that we've been using with the Jira platform for I don't know, four years we've been using composable and semi-fungible tokens and um, non-fungible tokens and completely fungible tokens. Yeah. And it's kind of nice to see the conversations happening. And then they only happen because people get excited and kind of go crazy over the sale of these NFTs for, you know, exorbitant prices. And, and then people start talking about it and going, well, what even is it? Yeah. And I've been asked, what is an NFT more times um, in the past six months than I had the four years before that. So those things are, are good. And it's, it's nice that people within the market are kind of taking on that role of marketing, what a token is. Um, even if it's in a way that sometimes makes me go, Oh my gosh, can I just have one of those? One of the, the funds yeah. of one of the NF tree tokens you're selling, like, please can we actually invest that in ag? So, um, there's that, that side of it, which is, which is great. Um, and the other, I mean, the other side, which I think is, is important as well to, to note is that a lot of people who um, have been, you know, in this blockchain world for a while um, and in the tokenized world really do believe in the ethos behind it. And that makes a lot of them like super aligned with a lot of, you know, ESG investment theses. Yeah. And so the opportunity to include them um, in tokens that are actually backed by physical produce and that can actually connect in with farmers is something that is so real to me and it's absolutely something like, you know, where we see the future going. Um, if we can bring in those lenders into um, the actual agricultural lending space and not just like tokenized trees, but investing in actual trees and regenerative practices on farm through the same technology, um, that's a great outcome. And that goes a long way to plugging that $2.1 trillion gap. So um, I see, I see them as key participants. I, I don't think that we have, um, the right system set up right now because most farmers don't want to receive payment in cryptocurrencies. So we need to bridge that gap. That's a problem for us. Yeah. That's one we will solve. Um, but I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the alignment, um, in lots of spaces. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about your experience, Brady, as a, a leader, um, you mentioned that you know you kind of had imposter syndrome. It might surprise you that every single exec that I've spoken to in the last twenty odd years, whether they have you know thirty, forty years experience or three months experience, has exactly the same challenge. Um, <laughs> I think yeah, you know, it's kind of been compounded in the last couple of years by the fact that technology and and the world's changing so quickly that none of us or every every one of us question whether what we're doing today is actually right and, and will be relevant in the next 12 months. When you look at your kind of your experience in leadership, what would you say are the key lessons that you've learned about yourself? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I find it so encouraging when people who I think are outrageously successful tell me that they also have imposter syndrome. <laughs> I, I, I love it when that happens because you go, okay, great. So if I can have imposter syndrome and, and look and behave and have a cheap like you, we're, you know, we're going to be totally fine. Um, I love that. Um, I think on, and like reflecting on, on my own leadership style, maybe, um, 
it's something that uh I think I think you maybe you mentioned it before in a very flattering way like I, I'm not looking for a leadership position mm. and I think what that does for our team and what that does for the sorts of people I want to work with is I you know I believe my whole team is smarter than I am and I love that I, I want to work with people who are better at doing what they're doing than I could be um that's that's how I that's how I see being part of a startup um people each have their own expertise and I know what mine is. Um, and I, I'm going to do the things that I'm best at. And, uh, you know, I'm going to bring in people who are way better at, um, obviously building the platform itself. And my co-founder is awesome at that. Um, but even things like, you know, running socials and doing all the kinds of things that are not my strengths and I prefer not to do. I think that that's, um, hiring experts and working with people who are super talented and trusting that um, they are really good and that they are better than I am at what they're doing is really important. Um, That's one part of it. Uh, I think one on the other side, um, I was going to say something and now I've totally forgotten it and I should take notes and maybe that's a good, um, piece of personal feedback as well. <laughs> um, I've got to leave this bit in now so you can critique yourself. Yeah, exactly. This is like a real time uh, coaching session now, Dexter. <laughs> um, how do you think, how do you think your, your people perceive you as a leader? Um, that is a good, I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's something that we actually put a lot of work into is like understanding each other's like styles of work. Um, we recently did one of those like strengths finder things as a team and we found that every single one of us share like learning as one of our, as one of our key strengths. Um, and, uh, I, I know that that's really important to us. Like pioneering is one of our values. And so, um, I, I think that in terms of setting the agenda and the focus, um, for our team, like a lot of my strengths become our focus as a team. Um, in the sense that we, we want to be pioneering. We want to be supportive. Um, I think one of the, the things that make, um, good leaders who I've seen and, and how I like to focus is being able to like personalize your approach and how you speak with someone and actually seeing where someone is at and trying to bring out the best in them. Um, I think that that's really important, whether that's a customer or, um, an investor or a partner or an advisor, like I want to get the best out of them in that moment and speak to them and see them and learn myself, of course, but also, you know, connect on, on the most yeah. meaningful, um, points for that, for that conversation, for that outcome. So hopefully that's something that my team gets a lot out of, yeah. um, and being able to focus our energy in that, in that sense. So there's a, there's a lot of, I, I guess, advice out there, a lot of, Many times it can be conflicting or not necessarily perhaps you know right in the circumstances, um, particularly when it comes to startups and and a lot of the advice that comes out from you know that that community, one of them being that you know you, you, it's difficult to launch a startup without a CTO founder. I think one of the challenges that you have when you have tech founders is is you mentioned that that kind of softer side you know, the piece around being able to connect with people, whether it's your, your employees, your partners, your customers can often be lacking and you'll miss, you know, kind of key insights for product development or, you know, key insights as to the culture of the business. How do you feel now kind of looking back and at your background of, of being a lawyer who, let's face it, you know, I remember as a kid, I was uh, very strong in, in kind of influencing and um, kind of arguing my case, and my my gran used to you know, call me the Philadelphia lawyer, right? <laughs> and was convinced I would become one. But those skills, even from a childhood, have really helped me in business and leadership, and you know, clients and my family. How how have you found as a, a startup founder looking back? You know, do you wish you'd have, have done the tech bit, or are you really happy that you you kind of stuck with law? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think that my team flatter me sometimes when they say, hey, like law and engineering are not that's not that dissimilar. There's a lot of, you know, if then, but otherwise, however, yeah. <laughs> language that we all use. Um, I think they're being nice to me. Uh, and, I, you know, my partner um, will regularly 
call me out when I'm kind of moving linguistically in circles around him for lawyering him. And he really (laughs) doesn't enjoy, he doesn't enjoy that on my personal, on my personal side. So, uh, I think that they'll, you know, like you, there was always like that natural tendency to be creative with words and pitching. And that comes very naturally to me. It gives me a lot of energy, which I think was what I should have written notes down about before, like know what gives you energy. Um, that brings me a lot of energy. If I know I've got a day full of like budgeting, accounting, preparing board papers, I know I need to pitch to someone in the afternoon for me to keep going later in the day. Um, and so being able to like navigate my own energy is definitely something that's really, really important and some good advice I've received in the past couple of years. Um, and so I, I know that that is an area that um, I've always enjoyed and something that from debating through to like, you know, model UN at university and everything else nerdy in between that I did, I've always invested in and loved that space um, of being able to articulate something and argue a case. But I actually was like a maths and physics person in high school. So um, I was told by, you know, the careers advisor, go and do engineering. And I was like, absolutely not. (laughs) So I was, you know, I maybe I missed the boat on like the, you know, women in STEM push. I might have just been a bit too early to see that kind of come through as it is like in high schools now. But um, I might have, you know, I might have enjoyed it. But um, I get a lot out of what I what I learned at law school still. And I think. yeah, I mean, there are definitely definitely days where I go. It would be way more fun if I could actually just get into the application and build what I'm what I'm thinking about right now, rather than needing to document and communicate that and get someone else to in our team to jump in and change the button around and change the user experience. Mm-hmm. But I think that being able to have that complementary skill to actually see the customer, understand what is going to work for them, and also not ask the customer what they want because a customer is not going to describe to you the future. They're going to describe to you their needs and then you need to be able to take them to the future. So being able to picture that pathway and then articulate that to a team and then have a team build it. Um, and I'm not going to understate that then have a team build it part. Like I've had so many founder friends fall apart on that side. Um, and you can't just plug in technical gaps in a product like mine um, with like an offshore team. Like Cadle is absolutely vital to realizing that dream. And I think that our skills are very complementary and line up nicely in this product space. Um, but yeah, definitely some days I'm sure he wishes he could um, speak, you know, mm-hmm. do some of what I'm doing and I wish I could do some of what yeah. he's doing, but um, it generally works pretty well. Do you feel then when you, you look at the, the journey that you've been on and, and where it's led you to now that um, you, you, you've you done the right thing, that, that you've kind of found your calling in life? Oh, that's a Yeah, that, that's definitely something I feel in terms of like um, ag and being in this like problem space. I feel like it's the, you know, the love of my life. Um, I also, I turned 30 a month ago and I'm very aware that I have a very, very long career ahead of me um, for many you know, reasons, lifespan and <laughs> everything else that we kind of look at these days and go, right, well, we're working till we're 80. Um, I would love to, you know, to think that Giora takes up the, you know, the, the bulk of what I'm going to do because I think our mission is the most important thing I could devote my mind to. Um, but I think that there's still, you know, there's, there's still a few other careers as a, you know, a carpenter and <laughs> as a, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that's, that's kind of my, uh, that's my gray day career. I go, Oh, I wish I just like was working with my hands right now. Mm-hmm. So maybe one day I'll be on a farm and we'll be yeah. building software and the, you know, the metaverse and, um, that'll, <laughs> that, yeah. that'll be a very different experience. I'm sure in 30 years when I'm, when I'm working on the next challenge. It's, it's awesome. What you've said there, Brady, two things that really can resonate with me is, one, what you spoke about around finding the things that give you energy. Um, again, you know, the, all of the advice that's out there where that you should meditate, and do all of these things. I've actually found my Zen in aspects of the work that I have to do for my business. So whether it's editing a podcast and I put headphones on and get deep into audio waves and trying to perfect everything is just, you know, where I get my moments where you switch off. And then the other bit that you've talked about is really about that, you know, def- not defining yourself by your career, but the career being the platform to enable you to express yourself 
in all the ways that you want to express yourself and that you get joy from. And I think it's kind of so critical now that, you know, particularly as we're at this point where we're talking about the great resignation and I'm seeing so many people that are lost because they've just quit their job mm-hmm. and then thought that what it was, what life was about was not doing anything. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's like when people retire and you know, all of a sudden five years later they've died because they had nothing to keep them going through the day other than going to the bingo or playing golf. Yeah. I, I've, I really feel that as well. I was speaking with someone recently, um, who's working to become a partner um, at a law firm and they're working to become a partner at a law firm so that they can retire was yeah. the answer to the, you know, what's the end goal. Yeah. And, and for me, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe making money and building a base is really important for you because of what you want to do with that. Um, but be clear about that, you know, be clear about why you're retiring because you want to have, you know, hand at becoming a pro golfer. Like genuinely, I, I'd, I'd be interested in that vision and, and in that platform and where you want to head with that. Um, I think that, you know, my why is really about connecting like, you know, my Zen space is like feet in the sand on a beach somewhere along the South coast. Yeah. Like that's, that's where I am when I'm connected. Um, and I think that that flows through, like I, Dior is all about connecting, um, how we work as a team. It's about connecting in yeah. with each other, with our skills, with the platform, with our cast core to, yeah. to what we're doing, um, and who we are. And I think it's core to who I am. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that when people are, are looking for their next step, it can be really daunting. And, and I, I'm always there, that voice saying, like, take the risky yeah. move, take the move that feels big because mm. you have it in you. And, and if you have that alignment with who you are, and I mean, that sounds a bit, it sounds a bit wanky and it's hard to kind of work. I'm, I'm from the north of England, right? And I talk about this stuff all the time and I drink rosé wine and people think I'm crazy, right? It's like, what's this guy <laughs> from a guy from the north of England who would expect them to be rough and all these things. I, I absolutely agree with you. And what you just shared there is what I would say is absolutely the optimal way if you want to create um, values and, and culture and, and have a, a mission statement around y- your business and, and who you are and, and how you operate. What you've just talked about there is absolutely the essence and, and the key to making that actually authentic and meaningful and, and actually attracting and retaining the right people. Because if you do exercises and just come up with a bunch of words that you all think are cool or that you all aspire to, it will fail. Absolutely mm-hmm. guarantee it. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to listen to this episode to, uh, <laughs> and take some notes myself. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, thank you. And, and I mean, I love being able to share what I care about and kind of what makes me who I am and have that resonate mm-hmm. with people. Um, as I'm sure you can tell based on the fact that I just told you that connecting isn't the heart <laughs> of who I am. But, um, I think that I'm, you know, I'm obviously really grateful for the opportunity to share that with you. So, um, awesome. thank you. You're welcome. Now you've been around the fintech space for a while. You know, your mentor person who got you into it is fintech OG. Um, what's your take on where the Australian fintech space is at right now? Uh, well, from my, from my vantage point in Singapore, where I, where I am right now, no, um, I think that it's, it's been a bit strange, hasn't it, over the past few years, because in a way, like, um, we've been able to kind of transcend geographical boundaries. And that's meant that we've spent more time probably with different people rather than as a community. Um, you know, I, I know that I, you've mentioned that to me in terms of like how we're kind of now maybe we're all connecting back in with each other. And I was speaking with, you know, Steve Vallis from Blockchain Australia the other week and saying, hey, you know, we've actually just spent 12 months with agri-tech investors and in the ag-tech world, but I, I'm my heart is obviously still with like the Australian blockchain community, with the Australian yeah. fintech communities. Like how do we tap back in? Um, I think that, you know, th- that's definitely been our space for the last two years. It's like, okay, we've been off kind of building and, and mm-hmm. connecting through different platforms. Now that we just need to dial in, we can be anywhere in the world. Um, 
And I'm definitely coming back to the point of being like, right, we still need to move the needle as a community. We still need to work together and see each other as colleagues and push things forward um, as Aussie fintech uh, people. So I think that I think that's a really um, nice place that maybe lots of us have found ourselves at the same time and that there's like this injection and it's good timing that it's blockchain week this week and I'm going to be with, you know, all the blockchain Aussie people in, in Brisbane on Friday. Uh, awesome. which is super exciting. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's definitely part of it. One of the things as well that is an interesting um, push that I'm seeing is for that like unified tech landscape yeah. and not creating so many buckets, which I'm, you know, as a, as a full-on tech slashy, I, I really support that. Yeah, yeah. I, look, I, I agree 100%. I think particularly Australia, it's such a small market. You know, I don't think we've got the luxury of, it, it kind of reminds me when I was younger and I was really into to house music and you know, you you'd just go somewhere and you'd listen to house music and then it turned into you know, all of these derivatives that, and everybody formed their own little groups and you couldn't possibly eat like drum and bass and trance and hip hop and this, or, you know, you had to just, <laughs> you had to be one or the other. And I kind of, I feel that way about FinTech a bit at, at the minute where you know, we've got all these kind of derivatives and essentially, you know, we're all interdependent on each other. Totally. And, and so many of us are multiple things. And so yeah. it's, um, it's nice to be able to participate like fully in a conversation. And, um, you know, I often find myself the only person talking about agriculture in a fintech space or the only person talking about financing in an ag tech space. And, the only person kind of talking about real assets in a blockchain space. Yeah. And so um, there, there are actually lots of us who care about those problems and care about the technology solutions. And I think developers are quite good at doing that. Mm. You know, where, where we use functional programming tools are kind of the core of the Jura platform. And, you know, those functional programming spaces are hugely diverse in terms of yeah. their problem areas. And so I think it's nice to, as you say, focus on, the common challenges, the common opportunities, like the commonalities between these different um, technology ex- platforms. And if we're, you know, if we're a group of founders, then there's plenty for us to talk about. Or if we're a group of like investors in a technology, there's again, there's so much there. We, there's yeah, no need to kind of set up those arbitrary lines, though obviously it's very helpful to have industry representation. Um, I like, I love the cross-border stuff actually. Mm-hmm. Well, Bridie, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. I'm so pleased to hear about the progress that you've made in the last couple of years. Um, we get some exceptional talent watching and listening to this, this show. Um, if anybody's interested in perhaps working with Giora, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, well, please get in contact if anything I've said has kind of resonated with you either as a supply chain participant or you know we're kind of growing our team in every angle possible at the moment so there's always um space for kind of aligned and um seriously motivated people so please get in contact you can head to our website giora.io and contact our team there if someone will get back to you um my linkedin uh can be a bit hit and miss. <laughs> it's right. a little bit flooded sometimes, yeah. but um, do try if that's if that's your preferred mode of contact, and we can switch to email to have a have a conversation. So awesome! And you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, please support the show so we can help elevate more outstanding founders like Bridie by hitting subscribe, giving us a like, and leaving us a comment. If you prefer to listen, head on over to Fintech Chatter Podcast. And until the next episode, stay safe. Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier 1 People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search.